Okay, welcome uh, all the participants. Now the second lecture today is by Professor Rita Pratham Munshi from Indian Statistical Institute who will speak on some applications of Delta Symbol. Professor Rita Pratham. Uh, thank you, Shankar. Yeah. And uh, let me start by thanking the organizers uh, for the kind invitation. So it's been a wonderful conference and I'm looking forward to participate uh, in the other talks too. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy birthday to Balu. I think it's on 15th, right? Day after tomorrow. But uh, And uh, I must tell the organizers that I'm expecting a slice of cake. So you have to just uh, send it to me by post. Uh, with that, so let me start uh, uh, today's talk. The, uh, the topic is some applications of Delta Symbol. And so these are going to be some recent applications. So something that I worked out in the last uh, three, four months, probably. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go straight to the statement of the theorems. So the first theorem I want to mention is a joint work with my student, uh, Sumit Kumar, and my former postdoc, Saurabh Singh. And it's about uh, level aspects of convexity. So it's about bounding the size of L function inside the critical strip actually at the central point, one half. So what we have here is we have a GL2 form F, so of level P1, you can take it to be, say, a holomorphic form uh, for SL2Z of, uh, of uh, gamma not P, P1. And uh, pi is a GL3 form. So it's a Hecke mass cast form of level P2. And I'm going to assume that P1 and P2 are prime and also they are co uh, they are distinct so they are co-prime to each other so that uh, c which is p1 cube and p times p2 square is the arithmetic conductor of the rankine silver convolution of f and pi okay so i'm not going to uh, go into the definition right now but uh, you will see some something about rankine silver gel function later in this talk so I'm going to, uh, so the main content of the theorem is that, uh, that the central value of the rankine silver convolution, L half F cross pi is bounded by C to the power one quarter minus some delta, where delta is positive, as long as uh, my choice of the prime P2 lies between square root of P1 and P1 to the power three by two, okay? So C is the arithmetic conductor of the L function and C to the power one quarter is the convexity bound, and we are getting something subconvex as long as our choice of the, fam, the, the levels are in certain range. Okay, so, uh, so that's my first theorem, and let me make some comments about this. So first, the, the rankine silver convolution uh, pi cross f is known to be an automorphic form for GL6 of level C, and this is a result due to Kim and Shahidi. And so C to the power one quarter, as I said, is the trivial bound or the convexity bound for the central L value, which comes directly from the functional equation. It's not that difficult to prove. And uh, the bound that I have written here, written down here, I'm not explicitly writing down what delta is, but uh, later when I give the proof of this theorem, you'll see what exactly we get as the bound. And that bound turns out to be strongest when P1 and P2 are of comparable size. So, if you take two distinct primes, which are not same, uh, distinct primes, which are of the same size, then the bound that we get is strongest. Okay, and uh, also let me remark that the subconvexity problem, so the subconvexity problem for such L function is still open when one of the forms is uh, kept fixed. So when pi is fixed and you're varying the level of f, or where f is fixed and varying the level of pi, the subconvexity problem is still open. Okay. But as long as you have a hybrid range, you can get something better than the convexity. Okay, the second statement is a joint work with uh, Roman Holowinski and uh, Jiki. And it's about uh, twists of or exponential sums involving uh, Fourier coefficients of GL2 forms. So let's take F to be a AK modular form or an AK mass plus form for SL2Z. And then you look at uh, this sum, uh, lambda fn. So this lambda fn are the normalized Fourier coefficient of f, twisted by e of alpha into the power beta. And uh, the length of this sum is uh, capital N. And the trivial bound that you can get from, uh, say, the ranking Selberg theory is 
uh, into the power one plus epsilon. And we can prove that it's bounded by into the power one minus delta uh, for some delta positive as long as beta is less than 1.6381 dot dot dot. Okay, the precise value of uh, this uh, number over here has to be still uh, is uh, under uh, consideration, but it looks like something uh, like this is achievable by the method we are applying. Okay, so uh, let me comment uh, that it was known for beta less than three by two or beta uh, less than 1.5. It was known due to work of Utila long back from 1980s, I guess. And it was recently uh, extended and uh, the same bound uh, range was proved uh, by uh, Agarwal, Holowinski, Lean, and Key using a different technique, using delta method actually. And this, is, this actually corresponds to the wild threshold. Uh, that means uh, if, you, if you use the wild bound or the, uh, the methods that gives you the wild bound, then, uh, then you, you get uh, non-trivial bound for such sums for beta less than 1.5. And let's recall that the wild bound for, in this case, was proved by Anton Gord in um, 1980 or 81. And uh, the bound is that this L function for this modular form or Hecker mass class form is t to the power one third plus epsilon. Okay, t to the power uh, one half is the trivial bound or the convexity bound, t to the power one third is the wild bound. Okay. Uh, so in that sense, uh, so the, this range it gives you an, an, uh, gives uh, extends your the range to something sub wild. Okay, so going beyond beta uh, 1.5 is sub wild in this problem. So it's something about sub wild in uh, GL2, and but our uh, main target is to really extend the range beyond two, and it seems to be a very difficult problem. And the main motivation is it's related to the, uh, the analog of Dirichlet divisor problem for uh, task forms. All right. Okay, so the, the last uh, theorem that I want to mention, it's still a uh, work in progress, uh, very much in progress. Actually, this is, we just started working on it, but uh, we have a sketch in place and uh, this is something that we are expecting to get. So suppose uh, pi is a, an SL3Z Hecke mass class form. And uh, then we're looking at the second moment of uh, L hub plus I T pi. Okay. And uh, so there's the integral which runs from T minus M to T plus M. So the, the integral is in a, in a short range. It's not the full moment. And we are expecting to get something like T to the plus three by two minus twice delta. As long as with delta positive, as long as M is between T to the plus three by eight and T to the plus five by eight. So as you know that the second moment of GL3 uh, uh, functions is a still a big important open problem. And uh, nice, uh, we don't even know for, uh, you know, it corresponds to the, uh, the sixth moment of Riemann jeta function for which uh, our result is not that good, right? So we don't really expect to get very good results here, um, but there will be applications of that. So let me recall that uh, Xiao Cheng in had in her uh, famous work had uh, this integral. So it was a consequence of the, you know, the, the spectral uh, bound that he, she had in her paper is the, the moment uh, for the symmetric square L function. So we were looking for any SL3Z form. She looked at the symmetric square of the GL SL2Z form, uh, ranging from the uh, T minus T to the power three by eight to T to the power, T plus T to the power three by eight. And she uh, bounded it by T to the power three by two minus one by eight. So for her, the delta was one by 16. And uh, uh, using such a bound, one can uh, derive a bound for the L function in the T aspect, uh, like Xiao Ching had for the symmetric square L function, the T aspect, she had three quarter minus one by 16. So three quarter is the trivial bound. And so she had a, a saving of one by 16 over that. Uh, as consequence of our result over here will be like, uh, we'll have a bound of three quarter minus delta. So it will be, uh, bound uh, in the T aspect for SL3 uh, form, uh, which is coming from the moment computation. Okay. So previously, uh, directly applying the delta method, um, I had proved that uh, the bound three quarter minus one by 16 for any SL3 form. And the method was uh, extended and um, uh, you know, and sharpened by a facial other wall. And he got three quarter minus three by 40, which looks someone, somewhat like the the limit of the uh, delta symbol approach, if you do it directly, 
But if you use, uh, if you mix this thing up with the moment method, then you can get something better. And uh, if I'm allowed, I uh, can say that if uh, it looks like the optimal choice for m over here is square root of t, and in that case, uh, delta turns out to be one by eight. So the the convex the convexity bound that we are expecting is three quarter minus one by eight. So it will be like uh, uh, you know, it will be like the the saving will be like the double of the saving that I had uh, previously. Okay. So these are the three theorems that uh, I wanted to mention. Uh, so yeah, so all of this uh, will be related to uh, what's called an arithmetic correlation. So we'll see that all, uh, the, all the three statements ultimately boil down to showing that certain arithmetic correlation is small. Right? So what do you mean by that? So we start with two sequences, AN and BN, so they will be finitely supported. And we want to look at uh, the sum S, which is a uh, sum of A n times B n. And uh, so we'll have some standard properties for this uh, sequences. For example, we will be assuming that, uh, that they are supported in some dyadic range. And in the L2 sense, at least that the individual terms will be bounded by into the power epsilon. So that the L2 norm will be, uh, will, will be, average, will be one in average, okay? Or into the power epsilon in average. Uh, and and uh, and we'll assume that uh, at least one of them is oscillating. Okay, so like sum of a n or sum of b n is small. If, you, if, if both are not uh, oscillating, then of course we do not expect any cancellation in the sum. Okay, and then uh, the the standard definition of correlation uh, is this, and the correlation is then can be written as s by n plus big O into the power minus delta. So if you show that uh, s is uh, smaller than n, uh, better if you get a better bound than the trivial bound, then we'll be showing that the correlation is smaller, and uh, so that uh, you know, than the trivial one. Okay, uh, so in fact, we'll be saying that these two arithmetic sequences are independent if you can uh, bound this s by uh, some power uh, into the power one minus delta for some delta positive. All right, and uh, so the general recipe that uh, we'll be uh, using. Uh, is our delta symbol approach. Okay, so let's uh, try to explain what the idea is. Uh, so we have, uh, we'll be looking at the space of all functions uh, on, uh, which are supported between, uh, in, in this dyadic range between n and twice n, so, uh, supported on the integers, and taking value in the complex numbers. So this gives me a, a space, a vector space of roughly a dimension n, and if you have two arithmetic sequence, that's the same thing as saying two vectors in this uh, space, then the sum or uh, the correlation sum that we are looking at is actually an inner product of A and B bar, right? And uh, so we can have a spectral decomposition of this inner product. So if you have an orthonormal basis of the space, then this inner product can be written in this manner. And and then, uh, so this will be our starting point. So start with an orthonormal basis of the space and write in this manner. And then for this individual uh, inner product A and psi V, so this inner product of the sequence A with the basis vector psi V, we'll have some sort of a summation formula to uh, transform this sum to something else. And uh, the type of things that we have in mind is Poisson summation formula or like Bono summation formula for GL2, GL3, or hard hard rank Voronoi summation formula, and we'll go to the we'll be doing the same thing with the other uh, inner product also psi v uh, b bar, and so with that s will be s will be transformed into something like this. So here uh, these are the dual uh, coefficients. This is the dual sequence a star and b dagger, and once we have dualized, then we will be the next step will be to apply Cauchy. To get rid of one of the sequence, so here I am getting rid of the a star n. So here we'll be using the fact that it's uh, the the L two norm is one on average, right? And so uh, and after that we'll just open uh, the absolute value and try to execute the sum over n yet using some summation formula. So uh, usually depending on what type of uh, vectors you are uh, allowing in the normal basis. So these are the basic steps. Um, so there are two summations. So start with a choice of basis and the choice of basis will depend upon the problem that you're looking at. And then you apply summation formulas. 
And then you apply Cauchy and open the absolute value square and apply another summation formula. So these are the basic steps. And finally, the end game, uh, sometimes it will be required, is to see what else can be done. Okay, so this is something completely vague, but usually you'll see that there's something else that can be done at the end. Okay. Okay, so now how do you get the orthonormal basis? So, so we are looking for uh, vectors like this, which satisfy uh, this. So delta VW is a Kronecker symbol, which is one if V equals to W and zero otherwise. Okay, so that's same thing as uh, trying to get an expansion of the usual Kronecker symbol. So here V and W are vectors, here N and M are integers. So this is the usual uh, expansion of the Kronecker delta symbol. Okay, so, uh, so this is the type of formula that we're looking at. And once we have such an expansion, we can surely write S as this. Okay. And, and so, uh, so the problem now is to see how to get uh, expansion of the Kronecker delta symbol uh, uh, and how, what type of functions can you get over here to get such an expansion. Okay. And one a source of such an expansion is called the circle method of the delta method. And in this uh, talk, we'll just restrict to uh, this uh, usual circle method and delta method and not talk about higher rank analogs of this. Okay, so, so it's, what is the usual um, circle method or delta method? So, uh, you know, roughly speaking, it gives you an expansion of delta NM, uh, which looks like this. So here, E of this is E of X is E to the power two pi I X, which is standard notation. So we are taking integers Q going roughly up to square root of N. So recall that our, our sequences were supported in between N and twice N. So the, the length of the equation, the equation is N equals to M. The length of this equation was N and we are allowing modulus going up to square root of N. So that's the usual thing that we do in circle method. And then uh, we have a sum over A modulo Q, A co prime with Q, the star denotes that. And we have this. So this is a very rough version of what we mean by a, a circle method or a, in terms of trigonometric functions. So if we had, so if from here we can uh, write down uh, the uh, vector psi Vn. So V is going to be the pair A and Q. So A is going to be modulo Q, co prime with Q, and Q is any integer going up to square root of n. And psi of Q n is going to be one by square root of, of n E of A n by Q. So that gives you an expansion of delta nm. Uh, of course, as I said, that this is a very is an oversimplification because we never have such a clean formula for delta nm. So there is always some intricacies hiding somewhere. Uh, and here it is the this is the right version of Duke and the advantage delta method. Uh, they have a function h, which you can write down explicitly but it's not really important to know what h is explicitly as long as you have you know the properties of h you can uh, work uh, out the details okay and in the in the in the form in the in this form you can actually you have the choice uh, of q you can pick any q to be, q to be any integer uh, but if you want to kill the oscillation in this h function then you take q to be like square root of n then at least in the generic situation where small q is like capital q this H has no oscillation whatsoever. Okay, so this is another version of the circle method. This is due to Klosterman. And here, uh, the H part, you'll see that there are some difference uh, that yeah, here A was a full sum modulo Q. The A was not actually involved in H. In the Klosterman version, the, the A is involved in H. So this part is the H part, the analytic part of the circle method. This is the arithmetic part. Okay, uh, but it's kind of explicit. Okay, it's completely explicit. The also uh, it's uh, this is a trivial delta method. Uh, surely, if you take your modulus to be much larger than the size of the equation, then this uh, already is good enough to detect the event n equals to m. Okay, and you will wonder why uh, this will be uh, of any importance here. But uh, this has been uh, recently used. Uh, in this field, in, in the delta symbol approach, to get very non-trivial bounds, so it's uh, you know it's kind of counterintuitive. Okay? So usually, in, when you do circle method, you really want to make the modulus as small as possible. But uh, I don't know why uh, it works, but sometimes even the trivial delta method gives you something non-trivial. 
Okay. Uh, another uh, delta method is uh, it's called the Bessel delta method. It's due to uh, Keshav and uh, Roman and uh, Lean and uh, Jiki and uh, and it looks like this. It's a kind of a mixture of the trivial delta and but you also have so you not only have an arithmetic part. So here you can take q smaller than uh, the size of the equation. You have to push in uh, some oscillatory integral here, which involves the Bessel function. Okay, so, so so the point here is that already, if you just stick to uh, like uh, trigonometric uh, functions only, or Bessel functions, uh, then you, you have different versions of the circle method and delta method already played. Okay, so as I said that uh, the choice of the delta method, the what type of delta method you'll be using will depend upon the problem that you have in your hand. Okay, and uh, so you have to, uh, a little choosy that is to pick the right method. Uh, usually, if you pick the wrong method, you get something worse than the trivial. Uh, so you know how to get to the right method. Uh, okay, so this is the proof of the first theorem. So the first theorem was about the rankine silver convolution of GL3 and GL2. And uh, in the it's in the level aspect. So let's recall what uh, the F was. So F was going, is going to be a GL2 form of level P1. So if you are more comfortable, you can just take uh, it to be a modular form of level P1, say so even even plus fixed away. Okay. And pi is a GL3, take a mass class form of level P2. Then the ranking silver convolution of this pi and F is, uh, is given by uh, this Dirichlet series. So lambda Fn, uh, these are the normalized Fourier coefficient of the GL2 form F. Lambda pi n are the normalized Fourier coefficients of the GL3 form pi. Okay, and uh, so we have n r squared to the power s in the denominator. And these things can be shown to be converging absolutely for real s greater than one. And since we are I'm picking F and pi to be Hecker forms, uh, you also have a Wheeler product, uh, uh, product representation of this L function in this half plane. And that Wheeler product will have six factors. For each prime, there will be six factor because it's a GL6 uh, form, really. And uh, you can show that this extends to an entire function and it satisfies a Riemann type functional equation. That means it takes S to one minus S. So the center of uh, symmetry is one half. The, conduct, the arithmetic conductor of this L function is P1 cubed P2 square. So you take the P1, F is twisted by GL3, so you have to take P1 cubed. And P2 pi is twisted by GL2, so P2 square. Okay, so that is a, of course, we are assuming that P1 and P2 are co prime. Okay, and uh, also, I, I think I mentioned in the first slide that it's known that this actually corresponds to an L function uh, uh, automorphic form on GL6. Okay, so it's an L function of an automorphic form on GL6. Okay, and uh, so we have a functional equation and a consequence of that functional equation is this bound. Uh, okay, so our problem was to get a bound for the central value of this uh, uh, GL6 L function. And uh, from the functional equation, we derive this. Okay, so this is, uh, so C to the power one quarter is the trivial bound and we're trying to beat it. So we have to allow a delta positive. And uh, in that case, I have to take my N here between square root of C, which is the square root of the conductor. That's the, the usual, the length of uh, uh, the sum appearing in the approximate functional equation. And uh, so since I'm uh, on minus delta over here, I have to go down up to C to the power one half minus two delta. Okay, so these are the uh, bits and pieces of the uh, expression that appears in the uh, function, uh, approximate functional equation of, uh, of this L function. Okay, and so we take this. So this is where the main problem is. So this is uh, so this is like the arithmetic correlation that I mentioned of the GL2 Fourier coefficient uh, LFN uh, lambda FN and the GL3 Fourier coefficient lambda pi and one. Okay, so usually you'll have an R over here, and R will also be ranging in some short range. But I'm going to ignore that part. I'm just going to take R equals to one. Okay, all right, and so if you take the uh, trivial bound, the trivial bound for SN will, uh, for this sum, um, you have like Cauchy and you use the uh, Rankine-Silver theory for GL2 and GL3, 
then you get that Sn is bounded by n to the power one plus epsilon. And if you put n uh, into the power one plus epsilon over here, then it becomes square root of n and n goes up to square root of c. So it will be square root of square root of c. So it's c to the power one quarter plus epsilon and that, that will be the convexity bound. Okay? So the trivial uh, bound uh, of, for Sn gives you the convexity. And uh, to get a subconvex bound, you have to show some cancellation in the sum Sn. Uh, that is the same thing as uh, showing that uh, these two Fourier coefficients, sequence of Fourier coefficients are independent. Okay. Okay, so as I said, we follow the recipe, we apply the delta symbol. So we separate the oscillation of the GL2 Fourier coefficient from that of the GL3 Fourier coefficient, delta NM. And then we use an expansion for delta NM. And here I'm going to use the duke fillinander rivanis delta method. So that will introduce uh, these trigonometric functions. And then uh, there was an H, uh, a slightly complicated function over here. And as I said, that if I take Q to be like square root of uh, the length of the equation, then that uh, uh, H function is not really oscillating, at least in the generic situation. And so I'm going to ignore that from the sketch. Okay. So in, in practice, you have to take a uh, look for, uh, you know, you have to consider small values for small Q also. And in that case, that part will be oscillating. And so there is some, some complications there, but it can, it can be worked out. All right, so this is the expression for SN. So after using the expansion for delta NM, and if you bound this here trivially, then you'll see that the bound is N squared. Okay, so by sacrificing the equation, we have lost uh, the size of the equation N. So our problem now will be to gain back that N, capital N, and something extra, okay? And I recall the second step was to, okay, so this is the individual inner products here. And now we want to apply the summation formula to this and this. In this case, those are readily available. Those are called the Voronoi summation formula. So first uh, for the GL2, if we apply the GL2 Voronoi summation formula, this is the expression that you get. So A becomes A bar because the level is P1. You get a P1 bar over here. And this will be the length of the dual sum. Okay, this is Q square. So Q is the modulus here times the level P1 divided by the initial length. And if you recall the size as Q was taken to be square root of N, so the dual length is P1. So I'm ignoring the factors. I'm not writing that this is equal to this. So there will be some factors appearing over here. There will be a Henkel transform over here and all that. And I'm going to ignore because I'm uh, ignoring the oscillation in the weight function. And so the Henkel transform is uh, just a kind of flat function over there. Okay, so next we apply the GL3 Voronoi uh, summation formula to the other sum. And here in this case, uh, this additive character gets transformed into the Klosterman sum. So this S here is the Klosterman sum modulo Q with uh, these two parameters. And the dual length uh, is, again, so it will be the cube of the modulus here. So that's Q cube times the level of the form pi P2 divided by the initial length N. And this turns out to be P2 square root of N, okay? Because Q cube was N to the power three by two. Okay, so we get uh, uh, this as a two dual lengths. And now we look at the A sum, okay? So we have the sum over A modulo Q of this Klosterman sum written over here. And from the GL2 Verona, we are getting these additive characters over here. And the nice feature of this GL3 cross GL2 thing is, in fact, it's true for any GLN cross GLN minus one, is that this character sum after these two Verona summation formulas will just reduce to something like this, which is just an additive character. So it's E of P1, P2 bar, M, N bar by Q. And if you uh, see how uh, this depends on M, you'll see that it's like a geometric series. So it's like something to the power M. So some point on the circle to the power M. So as you vary M, it's just going around the circle in a, in a geometric fashion. Okay, so after all this transformation, uh, this is the expression that uh, we end up with. So Q is like root N, this is the dual lens for the GL3, this is the dual lens for GL2. And this is what happened to the basis vectors actually. So these were coming from the basis vectors and after all this transformation, this is, oh, I should have an E over here. Okay, it's E of P1, P2 bar M and bar by Q. All right, now let's see how much we have saved by this. 
so we have applied a GL2 uh, and a GL3 Voronoi. So here from the GL2, so the saving here is uh, square root of n by square root of p1. The saving here is square root of n by square root of p2 square root of n. And the saving here is square root of q. Okay, so that's the three things that we have said. So this is the, the saving from GL2 Voronoi. This is the saving from the GL3 Voronoi. And into the power quart one quarter, which is square root of square root of n, is the saving from the a sum or the cancel sum, and this turns this turns out to be n by square root of p one p two. And recall that we had lost capital n, and our problem was to gain back capital n and something extra. And uh, so here we still need to save square root of p one p two and something extra. Okay. All right. So. So the last step was, as mentioned, we apply Cauchy. So we bring the GL3 uh, term outside. So we are getting rid of the GL3 Fourier coefficient. We still have the GL2 Fourier coefficient inside, but uh, here, uh, okay, again, we have the E over here that's missing. And, uh, and it's, uh, the reason we put the GL3 outside is that uh, this part is, very nice with respect to GL3, it's just a geometric series. So when we are open the absolute value square and bring the M sum inside, it will just be a geometric series if you know how to add. Okay. Okay, and now since we have done Cauchy, our job is to save P1, P2. Okay, before Cauchy, it was square root of P1, P2. So it gets squared. And so you have to save P1, P2 and something extra. And again, so we open the absolute value square. So these are the terms coming from the, whatever we had inside absolute value. And again, sorry, I, uh, there should be an E over here, okay? It's the E of uh, this, okay, so this is the geometric series. And uh, now if we apply the M sum, you can actually apply Poisson summation if you want. Okay, so the amount that you save is, uh, uh, you save the whole length of summation. That's the whole length of summation in P2 square root of N. In the generic situation, and generics means that uh, the terms there is not too close, right? So, and and the length is gives you a sufficient saving uh, if uh, the length is larger than p1, p2. That's how much we need to save. So that happens if p2 is greater than square root of p1. So this is one part of the theorem because we need uh, we recall that p2 had to be between square root of p1 and p1 to the power three by two. So this is one part. So. So we say that uh, the saving in the generic case, which is the off diagonal case is fine if my parameter P2 is larger than square root of P1. And now if you look at the diagonal case, so the diagonal case is when uh, here we do not have much oscillation where the terms are near each other, right? And uh, uh, the, the extreme situation is when N1 equals to N2 and Q1 equals to Q2. And in this case, we save uh, uh, nothing in the end sum, right? Because then this is just identically zero and E of that zero is one. So there's no, nothing to save over here. Uh, and, but we save the diagonal. So the saving will be the number of N2 times the number of Q2. So that's P1 times square root of N. And that is enough. That's larger than P1, P2. If P1 to the power three by two is larger than P2. Okay, so we get this range. And now if you uh, follow the argument here, then you'll see that uh, the ultimate bound that you get for the L function is conducted to the power one quarter plus epsilon times this term. So one of this term is coming from the off diagonal contribution. The other term is coming from the diagonal contribution. And uh, so we want uh, this to be smaller than one by into the power delta. And that happens if P2 is larger than square root of P1 times into the power something and P1 to the power three by two is larger than P2 times some n to the power something. Okay, so that, that gives you uh, the level aspects of convexity for uh, GL6 L function. All right, so now we uh, turn to the other problem, the second theorem, and recall that it was about, uh, about the sum S. So, so we have the Fourier coefficient. So F is uh, a fixed SL to Z uh, cusp form, uh, okay, and which has normalized Fourier coefficients. So lambda fns are the normalized Fourier coefficients. And for simplicity, I'll just write it with lambda n. Okay, so you have lambda n e to the power n e of n to the power beta. I'm ignoring alpha. You can put an alpha over here if you want. So I'm just looking at the simple sum lambda n e n to the power beta, and the length of the sum is capital n, 
And I want to uh, see whether we can have a power saving over here. And for what values are better, is uh, such a power saving allowed? Okay. So again, we use the delta symbol to separate uh, n from m, the oscillation of the Fourier coefficient and e of e of m to the power beta. And now, so in this sketch, I'm going to use the Klosterman version of the circle method. Uh, in the paper with uh, Roman and uh, and G, uh, we use uh, uh, the Bessel delta method that they had already used in their previous paper, okay, because uh, that gives you something. Uh, the technically uh, it you know, makes things simpler. Okay, Klosterman, and if you do, if you uh, follow Klosterman circle method, also you get uh, something non-trivial, uh, namely for some, some range bit better greater than three by two, but you have some some technical difficulties to take care of. Okay, so, but uh, here I will ignore the technical difficulties and I'll just assume that I'm using the Klosterman circle method, okay, uh, which we recall is given by this. Okay, and if we plug in, uh, plug in this, so this is actually uh, delta n is, is zero or one, that's what it's detecting. And this is n equals to m or n minus m equals to zero or one. So we plug in the Klosterman version of circle method here in that sum over there. And this is the uh, sum we end up with, expression we end up with. And uh, now we'll be using, uh, for this one, we'll be using a Poisson summation formula because this is all GL1 type of harmonics. And here we have a GL2 Fourier coefficient. So here we'll be applying the GL2 Bronner summation formula. Okay, so this is the next two steps. So if you apply the Poisson summation formula uh, from here, so uh, since this is the arithmetic part, uh, the arithmetic part will reduce to some congruence. So you get M is congruent to A bar modulo Q. Okay, and this E of M to the power beta and this will be put in the, uh, put in the Fourier transform. And so it's hidden over here. So there is some Fourier transform here, which is, which involves certain oscillatory terms. Uh, which you can try to evaluate using a stationary phase if you want. Okay, and uh, so here uh, my k is n by q squared. Okay, so I'm uh, so my q uh, here will not be so we will choose of q to be op optimally at the end, and q is not going to be square root of n. In the previous uh, case, q was uh, taken to be square root of n from the start because the problem was in the level aspect. There was no uh, analytic oscillation as such. This is um, a more analytic problem. Okay, there is analytic oscillation. And so we'll uh, choose a delta method where there is some analytic oscillation uh, present already. Okay, so we'll take, uh, so K is the amplitude of the analytic oscillation present in the circle method or close the circle method that we are applying. And K uh, is taken to be n by Q square. All right, so and we also apply the GL2 Voronoi summation formula to the n sum, and that transforms uh, this to this. So again, a bar becomes minus a by n q. And here we have an Henkel transform of this uh, analytic function here. Okay, and okay, so so far uh, we have saved this much, okay. So this is uh, so this is how much you save uh, from the Poisson, and so so here in the Verona you save square root of n by square root of k. In Poisson, this is how much you save. There is a congruence modulo q, so you have to take care of this. So that this gives you the how much you have saved from the Poisson and Verona and the the integral that you have. There is an integral over x over here. Yeah, this integral zero one. This is oscillatory, so we'll have a square root of saving in that too. So for that, you need to do some stationary phase analysis. Okay, so in total, this is the amount you've saved. So it's 10 to the power three by two minus beta by two. Uh, recall that amount that you need to save is more than N because N is how much you lost when you chose to draw the equation. And here, this is larger than N if beta is less than one, okay? And beta is less than one is like the trivial range or the convexity range. It's quite easy to prove. And uh, so uh, after Cauchy, the range that you get is just the convexity range uh, before Cauchy. 
And now we want to go beyond uh, this range. So we apply Cauchy and we get rid of the GL2 Fourier coefficient. So, you, so the lambda ends are all gone. Okay, so you put the Q and M part inside. And again, and since the problem here is like a GL2 plus GL1, with respect to N, it's just a, a geometric series over here. Okay. And here we have some oscillatory factor, which comes from the Henkel transform and the Fourier transform and the X integral. I'm not going to write down explicitly what it is over here. Okay, and again, we open the absolute value square and apply Poisson on the N sum. And again, as before, we have to see whether the diagonal contribution is good and the off diagonal contribution is good. So here, if you look at the diagonal, so you count the number of harmonics that you have inside the absolute value square. So that's the number of Q and M, and that turns out to be N to the power beta by K. Okay. And in the off diagonal, so that's how much you save in the diagonal. And in the off diagonal, since uh, if you look at the N sum, and since you have a geometric series, so the saving will be n by square root of the analytic oscillation. The analytic oscillation here has amplitude q, amplitude k, sorry. And so the saving will be k by square root of k. Okay, so that so that's how much you save in the off diagonal. Okay, so you have to uh, get the second derivative bound for the integral also. So you can, you know, take the n sum inside, do Poisson, and look at the Fourier transform of this function, and just use the second derivative bound for that that gives you a saving of k to the power one half. Okay, now you equate this two. So this is how much you save in the diagonal. This is how much you save in the diagonal. If you equate this two, that gives you the optimal choice for k and see it's n to the power twice beta by three. So it is, uh, so it is not one. Okay, so so uh, the q uh, equals to square root of n is not the optimal choice in this application of the circle method, the delta method. Okay, so if you pick k to be this optimally, then here you have saved square, k, square root of k. So if you go back, you have saved k to the power one quarter because this is how much you saved after Cauchy. So if you put that here, so multiply this with k to the power one quarter, and that turns out to be this or n to the power three by two minus beta by three. And uh, you'll see that this is larger than n if beta is less than three by two. So that was the uh, range that was that's already there in the literature. And this is the wild range, which corresponds to the uh, uh, wild bound. And the problem, as I said, uh, that after this Cauchy and Poisson, you see what else can be done. Okay, so with this, we uh, we hit the wild bound, and we want to get past the wild bound. We want to get something sub wild. So we we'll see what else is there to be done at this point. Okay, so uh, so let's go back one step. So this is the expression that you get after application of Poisson. Okay, so these are the sums and that comes from inside. Okay, so this Q and M. So we get two copies, Q1, Q2, M1, M2. And this is the part which you get after Poisson. Okay, so from this part, you get an equation, a congruence, sorry. And here we have the Fourier transform of that uh, analytic function that you have over here. Okay, it's not explicitly written down here. Right, uh, so, and then you notice, so what we notice here is that, um, so everything uh, here in the, in this arithmetic part, everything is modulo Q1, Q2. And uh, so N is too small, N is of size Q squared. So N modulo Q1, Q2 is nothing left over there. But if you look at M1 and M2, the M1, MIs are of size N to the power beta minus half by square root of K. And this turns out to be larger then the modulus. So here M1 is modulo Q1, uh, right? Because it's multiplied by Q2. So M1 bar Q2 is congruent to N modulo Q1. But since M1 is larger than the size of the modulus, I can uh, write it down in terms of the uh, congruence classes. So I can write down MI as some congruence class modulo QI plus QI RI. And then still in RI, we'll have something, some, of, uh, some size left. Okay, so Ri will be of size n to the power beta minus one. And since beta is uh, is at least near three by two uh, or even larger, we have some size in Ri. Okay, and then we consider the sum over Ri. Okay. All right, and uh, that gives you something better than three by two or something sub-wide. Uh, 
So that's the idea. And now uh, let's see what type of exponential sum. So here, if you look at the sum over here, it will be a purely exponential sum. And uh, it's quite interesting. So let me just briefly recall what type of uh, exponential sum. So we, we, we have what type of bounds we have for the usual exponential sum. So in the usual problem in exponential uh, sum is, uh, is to get a non-trivial bound for sums of this type. So this is a, uh, is a one variable exponential sum. There's only one variable n, okay? And uh, you assume that this uh, function f and the phase function over here uh, satisfies this. So you have some condition on the amplitude and the higher derivatives of f. And, and the basis of these parameters a and n, you can uh, write down a bound for s, which is a to the power k, n to the power l. And then this k l is called an exponent pair. So that's a, uh, definition of an exponent pair. And then uh, you try to find out what are the possible choices are there for K and L. Of course, what you really want to do uh, get at the end is K equals to zero, L equals to one half. I said that would be the ideal thing to get at the end. Uh, but uh, that's not known uh, for the general type of phase function. Uh, but we still know something about uh, the, this, the collection of this exponent pair. First, we know that uh, zero one or that is a trivial exponent pair that's always there. And then uh, the collection of all exponent pairs form a convex set, okay? And there are two processes. Uh, one is called the A process, the other one is called the B process. So the A process is the, is, comes from the wild van der Korput inequality. And it says that if KL is the exponent pair, then this guy is also an exponent pair. And the B process depends upon a uh, type of Poisson summation formula, with stationary phase. And it says that if KL is an exponent pair, then L minus half and K plus half is also an exponent pair. Okay, and uh, so using these two processes, even starting with the trivial exponent pair, you can get very non-trivial exponent pairs like this. Okay, but the one bad thing about uh, this is B is uh, involutory. So if you take B squared, then it becomes identity. So you cannot apply B consecutively, but if A is not involutory, you can apply A repeatedly in one place and still get something new. Okay, and uh, so one uh, nice advantage of this theory is that uh, one can get cancellation in very short sum, okay? and uh, that's that's a uh, that's a beautiful thing. Is that uh, yeah because it and it comes handy uh, if you are lucky uh, at the end game. Okay, so when you have Nothing else to do. If you're lucky, you can just lift with an exponential uh, sum, and then you just use exponent pair. Okay, so uh, that's what happened in the situation case we were considering uh, with uh, Roman and uh, G. So this is uh, precisely the phase function that you have there. Okay, so we have something like this. So there are two variables, R1 and R2. Uh, let me just go back. So this, I, I wrote down the exponential sum here for only one, but I have two of them because M1 and M2 are there. So I get R1 and R2, okay? And uh, and the phase function here looks like this. Okay? So there's a, there's a difference of two phases, psi R1 minus psi R2, plus a phase which involves both R1 and R2, okay? And the nice feature is that uh, this psi uh, has uh, amplitude n to the power beta, whereas rho has the amplitude n, okay? And beta is uh, like three by two or even larger. So the amplitude of the psi function is much larger than the amplitude of the phase which uh, which mixes R1 and R2. Uh, but nevertheless, it kind of, this mixing kind of creates some problem. And, uh, uh, and uh, so this is something we call an almost separable double exponential sum. If you didn't have this row, then uh, we'll surely get a very nice bound for the sum we're looking at and a very nice range for beta, uh, like beta will be going up to 1.76 or something if we had, didn't have a row there. But we have a row and uh, that creates some trouble. Uh, uh, okay, and uh, for such type of uh, phase function, there is not much in the literature because in the literature, if you look at the double exponential sum, the, the bounds uh, that are written down are only for uh, monomial phase function, or uh, at least for phase functions where there is a monomial which dominates the rest of the phase, okay, which is not the case over here. Okay? Uh, 
so uh, the choice is we either uh, ignore one of the sums. So suppose you ignore R2 and we just look at the R1 sum and then we just use exponent pair for one sum R1. Then we get uh, some non-trivial bound. And in our case, we'll get that beta is can be taken to be less than 1.56 dot dot dot. So it beats 1.5, so it's a sub while bound. Uh, or we can try to develop a theory of uh, almost separable double exponential sum. And that's what we do. And we are just still uh, you know, uh, looking at the details and seeing whether it's all correct. So there is something we're developing here for exponential sums of this type. And uh, that gives us a range which is much superior to the range that we have over here. So it gets better to be less than 1.6381 dot dot dot. So we use uh, uh, Bobmeri Vanich uh, theory over here. And, uh, and, and that, that's the, uh, that gives us the second theorem. Okay, so in the last uh, few minutes that I have, which is just one minute, I'll just give you a trailer for the uh, theorem uh, three. Okay, so here, uh, so recall, we are trying to get a bound for the second moment and a short uh, moment from M is a fractional power of T. Okay, and this uh, boils down to a shifted convolution sum problem with GL3 Fourier coefficient because pi is a GL3 form. And uh, there will be an, uh, an oscillatory function over here. And this is the oscillatory function that plays a crucial role in the approach that we have. And you'll see that if we take M to be like of size T, so if you are really genuinely looking at the second moment of GL3, then this part is not there and you're basically left with the shifted convolution sum problem, which is not that good, okay? which is not, we don't know how to get a non-trivial bound for that. But uh, if we allow a shorter range in the moment, we get an oscillatory term over here and this is also uh, this term we use to lower the conductor in the delta method approach that you use. Okay, and uh, with that we get uh, a non-trivial bound uh, for this as long as m is between t to the power three by eight and five by eight. Okay, and I'll not uh, give much details about this, uh, any more details uh, about this, and maybe next time uh, I'll come up with more details. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rita Bratha, for a nice talk. I think uh, there are two dimensional exponent pairs available, I believe. Uh, Srinivasan, yeah, from Srinivasan, we got something, but it is not as good as this. Okay, okay. I mean, I just wanted to find out if there is something available. Yeah, so, so here the different okay. A process, but that uh, doesn't give something this strong. Okay. Slightly weaker. Okay. okay, any other questions, please? Remarks, comments. Okay, if not, let me thank the uh, speakers uh, Ravi Ragnathan and uh, Rita Prata Munshi for the nice talks. And uh, the second session will start at 4 30, I believe, right? Yeah, 4 30. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay.